Agriculture used to be the key to sedentary human civilization, whereby farming of domesticated species created food surpluses that enabled people to live in cities. But does the case still apply today? Ladies and gentlemen, seven viewers of Managing Africa, you're welcome to yet another amazing edition of the program. Today we're talking about contemporary agriculture, and for that, we're meeting with Roland Formingham. He is a Cameroonian entrepreneur, a technological business development expert who also doubles as the president of Fortabe University. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be finding out his journey, his perspective, and a lot more on the program. So stay with us. Africa, a continent where climate change and crisis are a threat to food security. Could greenhouse farming be the solution? Greenhouse farming is a development of organic farming with new technologies to provide lasting solutions to Africa's agricultural sector. Greenhouse Ventures Limited, an initiative that was born in 2014, now has over 500 greenhouses in 120 square meters around Cameroon. It has as vision, moving Cameroon and Africa towards the second generation of agriculture, which involves the youths. It also aims at reducing importation of products that can be grown locally and with even higher quality. Greenhouse Ventures Limited has already spread its wings outside Cameroon to countries like Nigeria and Ivory Coast. The goal is to feed the local population and for now the focus is on Cameroon and Africa. The initiative was born by Roland Formundam, a business development expert and practitioner in sustainable agriculture using greenhouse technology. Welcome back televiewers. Joining us on board the program today is Mr. Roland Formundam. He is the founder of Greenhouse Ventures and he's a lot more that you'll be discovering. You're welcome on the program, Mr. Roland. Thank you very much for having me today. Let's talk about greenhouse farming. What is it all about and how is it carried out? Well, greenhouse farming is, we best describe it as a true definition of second generation agriculture. Okay. Uh, and it's, in clearer terms, is what we consider indoor farming. Um, it is a method of agriculture that uh, came into practice ever since the 15th century. And it came as a result of being able to grow crops in and out of the season. Since everything is grown in a very controlled environment, it is easier now to be able to adapt every crop to a particular environment and climate. And by so doing, we are able to assure a particular production from every plant. So in simpler terms, for example, we are able to grow crops be in the rainy season or the dry season mm -hmm. with the same results. Okay. Uh, we are able to grow crops with some level of uniformity. So a greenhouse that would have, you know, 100 plants, it is easier for you to calibrate everything to a point where each plant can give you at least an average number of kilograms without any problems. But in essence, greenhouse farming is a model of farming which is farmed under greenhouse conditions as they call them. So the greenhouse technology is either a wooden or a metallic structure that is covered in special plastics which okay. is UV treated. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it now helps for the growth of crops in and out of season. The kinds of crops that are planted in the greenhouse, does it take any or every kind of crop? Or are there particular crops that can be? Well, we can grow every type of crop within the greenhouse. What m changes is the design of the greenhouse. Okay. Um, so far in Cameroon, we only grow vegetables. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, in other parts of the world, they grow even trees. So our greenhouses measure uh, about 30 meters in length, about uh, 8 meters in width. Mm -hmm. and a height of about five meters. But of course, there are greenhouses that go up to about 15 meters in height, okay. where they grow even bananas okay. and, and things in there. So it depends on the design, and it also in terms of what you're looking for within the greenhouse. Why greenhouse farming? 
what are the advantages and what why would someone why do you prefer greenhouse farming to other forms of agriculture well greenhouse farming is missing in cameroon uh, so for us it wasn't a preference it was a need that we were more or less bringing into the country okay. uh, and it has several advantages many people would always ask the question why greenhouse farming in Cameroon? Cameroon is a tropical climate. We have a lot of rain. We have a lot of soil. Why greenhouses? Because, of course, greenhouses are mostly being practiced in countries where they have very limited lands, where they have challenges with water. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, in Israel, uh, for example, in Egypt, for example, in Holland, and all these other very small countries. But we're beginning to realize that greenhouses has a lot more to offer mm -hmm. than just being able to grow large productions on very small spaces of land. Big one advantage is the fact that in Cameroon and in Africa today, we have a big problem. The youth are no longer involved in agriculture. And we are getting to a situation where, because the farming population is getting old, they're getting weak, mm -hmm. they're unable to meet the production that is required in this country today. Mm -hmm. And that's why we are actually importing foods that we do grow. Uh, the only way that we can engage or attract the youth in agriculture is to change the way agriculture has been done. And uh, I say making it sexy, because the young generation of today, that is what they understand. And greenhouse farming is actually that form of agriculture that meets that need. It is manageable, it is small, um, you don't require too many people to run it. Mm -hmm. And the profitability is pretty much uh, in short. So it makes it possible for you and I to get involved in that form of agriculture without really stressing ourselves. We need to move away from that form of agriculture where you need 10 hectares of land mm -hmm. you know, to farm. You need tractors to farm. You have to go 10 kilometers away from the city to farm. Greenhouse agriculture can be done in the city, which is what you call urban agriculture. It could also be practiced in the rural areas. Uh, it could be practiced by anybody as young as 80 years old, even as old as 65 years old, without any challenges. Big other advantages in greenhouse farming is the fact that we can use very small lots of land and grow huge production. And I'll give you a very practical example. Okay. When you do tomatoes, for example, outdoors, mm -hmm. the variety of tomatoes that you grow outdoors can only grow to about one meter in height mm -hmm. and can produce just say about one kilogram per plant. So on one hectare of land, you would plant maybe about 10,000 plants mm -hmm. uh, and each one giving you one kilogram. But the difference now in greenhouse farming is that one, each plant can grow even up to six meters in height. So when one outdoor plant is giving you one kilogram, one indoor plant is giving you six to 10 kilograms. You get me? Okay. So which means that you are planting 10,000 plants to get the same amount of production that I am doing with 1,000 plants. Why? Because my plants produce more with height. Okay. Uh, and also with greenhouse farming, we utilize less water, less labor, little or no fertilizers. Okay. And the best part of it is that you are able to trace your produce. When you go to Mashi Sandaga, for example, where we buy most of our vegetables, you don't know where your production is coming from, whatever you're buying. With greenhouse farming, you're able to trace the source of your production of whatever you're eating. So we can tell you how this crop was grown and every aspect of it. So it is just a very uh, smart way of doing farming. And I believe it's a way that becomes very inclusive. Now you've been, you, you've been the first person that introduced greenhouse farming into Cameroon, to the best of my knowledge. And I'm very sure that you faced certain challenges to be able to implement that until it got to the stage where it is today. What are some of those challenges that you came across and how have you been able to, to mitigate them? Did the people welcome Greenhouse easily? Well, you see, when you are an entrepreneur, 
we don't see challenges, you know, mm -hmm. because after every challenge, when you overcome a challenge, you've actually introduced an innovation so, okay. True. and a solution. True. So yes, there have been so many challenges, but we've never looked at them as challenges. We've always looked at them as the processes of development that we have to go through. Uh, the key of it, of course, is the acceptance, what you call technology adoption. Mm -hmm. The people accept greenhouses. Believe me, that has been an uphill battle uh, because, one, we are a population of people who do not easily accept change. change. True. You understand? So I remember when we started, they looked at me and said, oh, who is this young man? Because you've lived in America, you've come back, and you want to come and show us what we've been doing for 200 years. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, these little kids, when you guys go out, you, you know, the, so there is, like and this is in my village. This is by my own family. So if this is in your own village, by your own family, how do you think that, you know, those outside would be able to see value in that? But of course, we understood that we needed to do so well mm -hmm. to market the product. And it wasn't marketing the product, it was marketing the value of the product. Because we also have a notion where I want to see one hectare of land to believe that anything will come out of it, even if I'm harvesting just 50% of it, than to give me a small house of 1,000 square meters and tell me that I can harvest more than a hectare. Mm -hmm. So people needed to understand what value we be able to bring. So we overcame all of that. Um, we also had moments even when members of government told us, I remember one time in 2015, I met with the then Minister of Agriculture and told them about greenhouses. And he blatantly told me that greenhouses are not for Cameroon. Okay. Uh, yeah, he, he, I mean, this is the Minister of Agriculture, right? <laughs> so if he tells you that, then you, you might as well just pack your things. Have and, you met and with him recently? Uh, no, unfortunate thing is that anyways, <laughs> he told me that the day I would make a greenhouse work in Douala, mm -hmm. he would authorize it for the entire country. Awesome. But unfortunately, by the time we did the greenhouse in Douala, he was actually on exile. Uh, and that's usually the, that's the, the, the situation. So um, these challenges are always there. Mm -hmm. um, normally, if every country that has really succeeded with greenhouses, as we have it, most of them, let me say so 90%, mm -hmm. the government was part of the introduction of that technology in the country. It requires a lot of money. It requires a lot of sensitization. It requires a lot of things. Uh, we've had that challenge because we are the ones to do this. Uh, but again, I am actually very happy because it's been about eight years since we started and we are beginning to succeed. You know, uh, for me, it, it's, it's, it's a big win for us because it is not personally, uh, I think it is also something that would encourage other people to realize that, okay, you do not always need the government Yes. to do certain things you can always do certain things and then the government becomes a partner like we are doing right now mm -hmm. so yes from the adoption curve to the uh, adaptation to everything it has been trendy and of course we also had the crisis we were based in Bamenda prior to the crisis we had set up everything we had a very huge farm everything was going too well of course the crisis hit us and like every other person we're here, but like you say, you know, uh, everything happens for a reason. Mm -hmm. uh, we now, today, we've been able to build over 500 of these greenhouses in over seven regions of the 10 regions in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, we are doing quite well in terms of um, introducing our products in almost every supermarket in the country. Okay. Uh, we have even begun exporting some of our products. I believe that that has also been um, a product of the displacements that we've had or the challenges. Okay. So yes, they have come challenges, but all of that have led us to the successes that we, we are here today. So they haven't really been challenges. I think they have just been parts of that entire process for us. Awesome. Yeah. Still talking about challenges, um, let's look at the Russian-Ukraine crisis that has affected so many other sectors in Africa and the world generally. How has this crisis affected greenhouse ventures? Well, you know, similar to uh, the COVID, when COVID crisis hit, right? Yes. 
we had our biggest market at that time. Okay. You get how, it? How so? Yeah, because with COVID, there was a lot of restrictions about people going out, oh. movements, and, and people became very sensitive to cross-contaminations, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, you were afraid of everything you touched. And so on one side, people looked at greenhouse farming because mm -hmm. you remember that year we had a tomato crisis because the boundaries were closed. You know, people who were used to importing could not, could not import. Those mm -hmm. who had to export couldn't export. We had a surge in price and then a drop and all those things. You see, greenhouse farming, like I said, we are consistent year round. If there is no earthquake, if Jesus doesn't come for the second coming, <laughs> <laughs> we remain in production. So when the crisis hit, uh, we were producing very normally. So we had a very high demand okay. in terms of what we could produce. The other thing is our prices are always constant. So when prices were fluctuating with all other crops, we had stable prices. We had stable production. So we had a huge demand. Okay. The third aspect is the fact that when you consume our products, you can actually see where the products come from. You know the quality, how it was being grown and everything. When people became so sensitive about how they eat, what they eat, where their food comes from, mm -hmm. they, they came to us. So with all of that, then other people started realizing, oh, I think it was the time for me to have my own farm. And greenhouse farming was, 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 was us. So moments of crisis, like the Chinese would say, there is always an opportunity. And we banked on the opportunity that came. So same thing with the Ukraine uh, crisis. Okay. The crisis today, we are going through a huge problem. One which in the next six months would have a global effect on food production. And not only food production, but on unemployment as a whole. Sure. You see, the Ukraine crisis has caused a surge in prices, especially fertilizers. Mm -hmm. How had, what has happened then? The small scale farmer who used to buy their fertilizers for 10,000, farm their one hectare, now they can no longer buy that. They have to buy that for 50,000. They don't have that amount of money. Sure. So many people have switched their model of farming. Most have even gone out of farming. Granted, uh, with the increase in, in, in fertilizers and all the challenges that we're beginning to have, there are many more people now who are beginning to look at agriculture as an opportunity for investment because food prices are going up. And to be honest, if you're not doing plantain or palm trees or coconut and all of that, you're doing vegetable farming. And we've been able to prove to people that vegetable farming is the way to go because it's short term. The returns are faster or quicker and are better. So yes, with, even with the Ukraine crisis, we've had a lot more demand for greenhouse technology, a lot more demand for greenhouse grown produce and a lot more demand for people who actually want to get trained in greenhouse farming. What is your appraisal of the government's policies on agriculture? We always have the best policies on paper. Um, it is not only for Cameroon, I think in the entire world, because yes, agriculture is not really being valorized. Mm -hmm. um, the role of agriculture has taken a backseat in a lot of developing nations, which is very, very sad. In America, you would talk, you would not talk about a farmer the same way you talk about a politician. Farmers are well respected. You will never hear a day that farmers have gone on strike in America. The day they do, America would stop functioning because it is a country that depends on their food. You understand? Mm -hmm. um, we need to change the way agriculture is being regarded. We need to change the way we invest in agriculture. Agriculture should not be theoretical, it should be practical. It is sad to say this, but in Cameroon, there is no school that trains in greenhouse farming. But we've been preaching second generation agriculture since 2010, as I remember. Mm -hmm. You cannot preach second generation agriculture and you still practice traditional agriculture. Which is why today, of the many schools that we have that train agriculture or agriculturalists or farmers, mm -hmm. very few of them go on to work in farms. 
You get it? Like, yes. think, look at any person who was who went to any school of agriculture. They're not in any farm. They're actually looking for a job in the office. They are looking to write a conco. So it it it's very different. If we if if agriculture was like customs, if it was like the police, if it was like taxation, where people are so happy to get in because they will get a job thereafter, they will do something, things would have been very, very different. So I think that those policies should reflect the practical nature of things. Like I said, they are very good on paper, mm -hmm. but it's missing a practical reinforcement. Okay. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the, the fact that students actually graduate from agricultural programs, but they don't actually practice it. What, what has gone wrong? Where do you think that agriculture can be introduced at basic levels, maybe, to encourage that so they start growing up with that mindset? No, it's, um, it's not even encouraged at the basic level. You see, I, I would throw this in. It, it, could, it could have been the way that, you know, uh, the, the, you know, sometimes when I get Pan-Africanist, I say maybe the, the colonial masters planned it to be so that we cannot have dependence on our own food production. You know, when you don't produce your own food, you cannot control yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem we are facing today. We grow coffee, but very few of us consume locally grown coffee. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, we need to change the entire mindset <clears throat> around agriculture. You see, the person who is a farmer does not encourage their children to become farmers. We want our children to become pharmacists, doctors, engineers, all of that. That's really true. You understand? Yeah. And it's a problem. In America, the farmer wants the child to be a farmer. Mm -hmm. They grow on a farm, they live on a farm, they work in a farm. They have farms that are 10 generations. That is totally different. So that mindset needs to change right from home. You see, you can never go, you go to any school today, ask the children, like they used to ask us, what do you want to be in the future? Like nobody would say, I want to be a farmer. <laughs> you get it? You can yes. sample 10,000 children today. I guarantee you that. Nobody will say, I want to be a farmer. It is sad. How do we hope to eat? You see, we are moving into a generation where we have to start depending on processed food. And it is what we are having now in America or in the Western world. That's why when the COVID hit, people are very surprised that Africa was not hit as much. It is not because God is looking over us. No, it has been the diet that we eat because we eat things that reinforce our own immune system natural foods. It is very important. So I think the notion of agriculture should not only go to being a farmer. Mm -hmm. Agribusiness is missing. They need to teach agribusiness very well. Okay. Because you know the challenge we have in Africa is this. The farmer is not the marketer. The marketer is not the farmer. There is a very big divide. Mm -hmm. The person who grows the food and the person who sells. Yes. If the farmer could know how much their food costs on the market, Believe me, they will not sell through the middleman. They would want go and sell themselves. themselves. Yes. And that's what needs to be encouraged. You see, where we come in in agriculture is that we don't only farm, we sell. Okay. When people come to our school, we don't only train them how to farm, we train them how to sell what they farm. Okay. When I build a greenhouse, if I had to build a greenhouse in this lot here, yeah. right? Yeah. I will not take the produce to send to Yaoundé. I will sell to all my neighbors. You get it? Mm -hmm. It makes no sense that I have a farm here, but my neighbors live from here to Bonaberry to buy food. When the farm is here, it makes no sense that I have to farm here, then I will take my food to Bonaberry. So my neighbors should go to Bonaberry. You get it? Yeah. So we create markets around our farms, and it's very important. So you connect the consumer to the farm. Right now, let's talk about import substitution. Okay. Um, the Cameroonian government is doing all it can to encourage uh, locally made products. How can greenhouse ventures or how can greenhouse farming actually be encouraged by the government so that we don't get to um, uh, import products into the country? Yeah, first of all, uh, let me list you some of the things that are, we import with a lot of embarrassment, <laughs> right? Okay. Cameroon is the second largest producer of tomatoes mm -hmm. in sub-Saharan Africa. Okay. 
but we still import tomatoes. You get me? Like, I'm sure if you talk to 10 farmers, they are doing, six of them are doing tomatoes, but we still import tomatoes. I'm shocked to hear that. We still import corn, but every backside that you pass, <laughs> there is corn. You get it? Yes. The corn that Brasserie uses is not locally grown, it's imported. Really? Yeah. You get me? Mm -hmm. We import Nescafe for something that we actually exported. You get me? It's disheartening sometimes when I bring up this topic because I don't like to think about them. Mm -hmm. But we have to talk about them. These are things that need to be addressed. Definitely. So on the part of the government, I like to say that the government is doing a lot. But I think it's at the level of the entire population. We are not taking up that opportunity. You see? Mm -hmm. Because if we, if we had, for example, today in Cameroon, we have been able to reduce the importation of bell peppers to about 90%. You see, yeah, awesome. we, like every supermarket right now, you have our bell peppers, you have local variety. I remember when we started with approach supermarkets, and the supermarkets told us that, listen to this, supermarkets told us that Cameroonians are not yet ready for locally grown bell peppers. If we had to supply our bell peppers to them, they would change the brand. So it would be written that they're grown in France or Mexico or whatever. And I refused. Yeah, because okay. I wanted Cameroonians to know that we grow these things here. Yes. Apples, we grow apples. Grapes, we grow grapes. But everywhere you see on every shelf is written import from France, import from Mexico, import from Morocco, which is not what we really need to be doing. Because unless we begin to make people understand that there is a local market for these things, then you can encourage people because every person believes that when you get into agriculture, you have to export. You see, right now, I don't even export anymore. If I send anything out, it's to Gabon, Equatorial Guinea, Chad. I don't send anything in the plane. I don't. Because I believe I would not even satisfy the local market. The local so the Made in Cameroon movement is one which needs to be encouraged, mm -hmm. but one that needs to be organized. I believe that the government is doing everything in place, though we continue to be so dependent on the government. But I believe that the challenge is left to us as citizens to be able to pick up that opportunity, to be able to meet up the market gaps that have been created in the society that we have today. Now let's talk about technology in agriculture. Um, are you making use of some technological ad advancements in the greenhouse ventures? Yes. Um, my, my background is actually technology development. True. Um, before we came to developing the greenhouses, we had developed seven other technologies. Okay. We have seven technologies that Cameroonians are using today that most of them, or maybe none of them even know that I, I was part of introducing them. And yet you asked me to call you a farmer. <laughs> <laughs> when you do more. Great. Well, uh, yes. Um, before we before we started with the greenhouse technology, because people need to understand how come we came about the greenhouse technology, mm -hmm. and I will take one minute to give you that rundown. In the beginning, we were working on developing sustainable technologies. We realized that there was a big problem of preservation; people could not preserve food, you know, to last long. So my first technology was a preservation technology, which didn't use electricity, didn't use any gas, but could preserve food for at least two, three weeks. But we realized that in the villages where we were selling the technology, most of the people there were farmers, yeah. and they could not afford the technology. So we needed to find a technology that would give farmers more profit, okay. more production. Okay. That's how we came with the greenhouse technology. Oh, wow. Awesome. But before we even did the greenhouse technology, we introduced what we call a mechanical water pump. We have a water pump that does not utilize electricity or anything. It's a, you just paddle it, okay. and it can pump water from at least 100 meters okay. into your farm. We have a corn desheller. We have a little device that is used to scrape corn from the curb. Mm -hmm. We were the ones who introduced green charcoal, you know, charcoal that is made from grass, not from cutting down trees. Okay. You see, uh, yeah, you use grass, it's like coal, it burns no flame, no smoke. Uh, quite interesting idea. 
We actually have a whole preservation house that we, a recent one that we just introduced, that can store food for up to four weeks. It doesn't use any electricity. It's a house, but built with some ecological aspects. Mm -hmm. um, then before the greenhouse. And then even within the greenhouse now, we have the drip irrigation system. Okay. There's a system of irrigating our farms that makes sure that every plant gets equal amount of water equal amount of food. That's why within our greenhouses, my plants grow uniformly, they produce uniformly, the size of the fruits are uniform, the quality of the fruits are uniform. It's like all my fruits are like twins. Wow. You get it? Awesome. So, I'm about to leave you, but not yet. Let's talk about the African continent of free trade, which is the next big thing. And just for the fact that there is the African continental free trade at the moment, do you think that it is a reason for people to get into greenhouse farming? Because it, it, it stands like an encouragement. Yes, uh, to just to your point, we were one of the individuals that were consulted for the trade agreement. Okay. I think if you even look at the promotional videos, we were one of the individuals that played part in, in that. Um, that is the way forward. You see, in global sense, think about it. America is a continent. It's 50 countries in one. Okay. okay? Mm -hmm. Asia is a continent. Mm -hmm. Too many countries. Europe, too many countries. Africa is the only continent that has been fragmented into 54 countries. So you understand that it's a very big problem. So we need to unify that. Not only unify movement, but being able to unify trade. Mm -hmm. I need to be able to trade with Nigeria the same way I can trade with Gabon, the same way I can trade with Chad and all these other countries. Mm -hmm. Because unless we get to the point where we look at Africa as a country, we would never develop. You know, back then we used to blame the white man for saying, oh, Africa is a country. But in real <laughs> sense, we need to look at it as a country. Because we look at the I mean, United States of America as yes. a country. But those are 50 countries yes. in one. OK? Yes. Yeah. So unless we can look at Africa as a country where I can drive from here to Senegal without a visa, mm -hmm. it makes no sense that it, you pay from here to Gabon. Your air ticket costs more than you live from here to America. That's a problem. So they encourage you to actually go to the wild man's world, <laughs> but not to your own brother's place. You get it? So it, it is a big problem. It's a problem that we need to start fixing now because it would affect many generations down the road. So the, 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 the free trade agreement that we are getting amongst African countries is one that should be encouraged. Oh, Mr. Roland, what is your advice to our viewers? What is the, what, what do you have to tell the people who admire you, people who want to be like you, people who have projects out there but they've not taken the steps, people who are doing something but they may not be going about it the right way, and people who still don't have that mindset that is needed for the change that we are looking for. What is your advice? Well, my, my advice to us is, uh, we have a major problem. And in my own words, the problem we have is that of identity. We do not identify ourselves as valuable persons. And because of that, we do not find purpose in what we do. Most of us, I believe, are living lives of others, doing what others want us to do, not what we actually want to do. Mm -hmm. I believe once we can resolve that issue of identity, Identifying ourselves as people of potential, identifying ourselves as people of value, of virtue, of charisma, we would be able to find that true passion and be able to identify what we consider as purpose. Once we have purpose, believe me, you become very limitless. I, I do not encourage people to be like Roland Formundam because Roland Formundam is, of course, we have our own challenges. I expect people to become better than who Roland Formundam is. And that's what we should be encouraging many people to become. Become the better versions of them. 
and become the better versions of who they consider as their mentors. I believe that once we strive for excellence, we can go a long way to strive for a betterment of a better environment for us all. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me again. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you heard it right from the horse's mouth. The, there has been a lot to learn. There has been a lot to take in. There has been a lot to take back home. And uh, this is what has brought us to the end of this edition of Managing Africa. Thank you very much for staying with us. And continue watching the program as we have subsequent editions coming up every Saturdays at 6 p.m. Thank you for staying with us and have a lovely day. Bye-bye.